Uh, hello and welcome to a uh, short course in Unity. Uh, I'm going to be using Unity 5. Uh, it's free to download. So uh, go ahead to unity3d.com and download it if you want. Uh, I will go through a bit of code and a bit of uh, how to make games in Unity. We do have some computers behind you set up so you can try it out yourself. Um, but first I'll just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Thomas. Uh, I uh, studied game design here in Hamar. Uh, I do a little bit of everything, from programming to 3D graphics to a tiny bit of sound, level design. Uh, and I am a co-founder of Dark Codex Studios. We uh, started with uh, the demo scene here at the gathering 10 years ago, something like that. Um, we uh, had a lot of fun here. Uh, eventually started to take things a bit more serious and made a games company. Uh, we uh, managed to get support money from the Norwegian government for a couple of games. We've won a couple of awards, uh, but didn't really go far enough with it. So uh, I started working at Funcom. Uh, stayed there for two years uh, before I moved on to uh, Creative Spill, uh, which is in Oslo. Uh, I started using Unity a long time ago, when it was brand new, uh, and it was not free. It took a long time uh, like getting used to it for me, because it was a, uh, quite, a, quite a new and unique experience for game developers. Uh, you had the level design and editing tools together with the programming, and it, it was a bit awkward at first, but now it's a really great program that is really simple to use and learn. Um, a bit about my hobbies. I enjoy a lot of games, uh, primarily ones that don't exist anymore. Uh, I started gaming on the ZX Spectrum many, many years ago. My favorite platform was the Amiga. Um, so some of the games I like are really old, but some of them are still around. Final Fantasy, Zelda, they're still around, luckily. Um, that was very short about me. I also have other hobbies. I do a lot of pen and paper role-playing game, Magic the Gathering, Warhammer. I do archery and sailing. Do quite a lot of things. But you are more interested in Unity than me. When you first launch Unity 5, you need to uh, make an account and log in to that account. You can then choose the pre, uh, free version or the professional version. The free version is obviously free, so it's where you should start. Uh, after that, you get asked to make a project like this. Uh, you can choose between 3D or 2D. You can change at any time while working on your project. This is just the initial setup. I will choose 2D because it's slightly simpler to explain. And we will call this project Gathering. Uh, choose a path to save it at, and click Create. Um, the thing with Unity is the way it works is you have lots of objects in a scene. Uh, you attach components to them, which are components include information like position or small pieces of code or collision. And the, in standard programming, you usually have a lot of code and pretty much nothing visual until you press play. But in Unity, it's more like you, uh, you keep stacking things on. You have objects in a scene in 3D, and you keep adding code bits to it until you get something working. So when you first launch Unity, you will have a layout that looks like this. Now, on the left here, we have the hierarchy. This is a list of objects in your scene. Everything in Unity is about scenes. Uh, think of it like a movie set. You have one scene, you have lots of props and actors in the scene. And then when you go to a new scene, you have new props and actors. Same in games. Uh, many of you are, know like, the traditional setup with levels. So once you've killed the boss, you go to a new level. 
which is then in Unity, that would be a new scene. Um, so the hierarchy displays every object in your scene. We have the main camera there right now, and not much else. In the middle here, we have the scene view. This is where I can edit things. This is my level editor. Uh, I can also see the camera. I can select it, just like I can in the hierarchy. And I can pan around the camera. I'm using the middle mouse button to pan around. Uh, you also have another tab here that says Game. Game is what your players will see. Uh, right now, it's showing what the camera in our scene is, is filming. Uh, we also have the inspector on the right here. Now, if I select the camera, you see that I have settings I can change on the inspector. Uh, at the bottom, we have Project. Project shows all the files that I want to work with. They're not necessarily in my scene, but they are available to me to work with. That is now empty, but I can go and drag pictures in there or sound files, uh, and then I can use them in my scenes. I also have a Console tab. This displays any messages or errors that I might get when I'm working which we will probably have a couple of. <laughs> so when I select my camera, as I said, you have objects in your scene, and you keep adding small pieces of code to it and stacking them up. These pieces are called uh, components. So here we have a list of components. We have transform. Every object has a transform. This tells us the position and scale and stuff. So if I change the X here, you see my camera will move in the scene. I can also just drag it around by clicking on the arrows to move it. Next is camera, which is the main piece of this object. Here I can change settings about my camera. You see a preview here as well. So if I change the background color, the, that is the background of my scene. Um, there's also a lot of other settings here that we can change. We can change the protection to be perspective or orthographic. Uh, perspective means that the further away objects are, the smaller they get, which is useful for 3D, but not that important for 2D. So we will leave it at orthographic. Orthographic means that there is no stretching depending on the dis distance. So objects far away are the same size as objects close, which is OK for 2D games. We have a couple of other settings, but we don't really care about them right now. Then we have GUI layer, flare layer, and audio listener. These, again, are not that important for us right now. Uh, the GUI layer tells us that the, uh, this camera can show the GUI. Flare tells it it can have special effects like lens flares. And the audio listener tells us that this is where the player hears from. You can only have one audio listener in a scene at a time. And that's for when you have sounds in your scene. Uh, that is the point that you will be listening from. That is your headset. Uh, so when objects move around making sounds, it knows where, to, where you want the sound to come from when you're wearing headsets or speakers. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to click Game Object. And here we have a list of things we can create in our scene. Uh, for example, I can make a 2D object sprite. And then I can go in the inspector and select a sprite here. We have a couple that come here. I will select Knob. And now if I zoom in, we, you will see I have a small circle. If I go to the game view, you can see it there as well. That's basically how you make objects. You can also click Create Empty if you want and just start adding components. I will delete that. Or you can create some ready-made stuff here. Now, before I continue, I want to change the layout a bit because the default layout is quite awkward to work with. I prefer having game visible at all time, so I can see what the camera is showing. I also prefer having my project on the side here and my hierarchy together. Console I don't need, so I will move it behind the scene. And now I have a layout that I much more prefer. I have my inspector and objects on the side here, and I have a big, nice view to work with and I can see what my game is showing. I will, no, I don't need to. I'll select this knob, 
And uh, you can see I can move it around in the scene. I can also scale it, make it bigger. You also have some buttons at the top here. You have move, rotate, scale. They are very important. You can also use the shortcuts W, E, R for those. Uh, so I can scale it. Uh, you don't really see this now, but I can rotate it and obviously move it. The last one is for strictly for 2D. If you're in 3D, I can go to 3D mode. If you're in 3D, this last button doesn't work. Well, it does, but it's not very good. In 2D mode, however, it lets you shape things similar to scaling, but it's a bit different. And you can also move them around. It's a more universal tool for 2D objects than doing scale and move individually. So we have our knob here um, in our scene. You can then add some components. Uh, right now, our project doesn't have much, but we do have, for example, physics. So I will add a rigid body. Uh, and I will create a, uh, another sprite. To this one, I will add a box collider. And to our knob, I will add a circle collider. Let's see if this works. Press play, and you will see how your scene reacts. You see that our ball fell down. If I now copy it, I will explain how these work in a minute. You will see that they fall on top of each other and roll off. The reason they did this is because I added two components. I added the, <laughs> I added the box collider to our our ground, our floor. Uh, that tells us that it has collision. Uh, you see the, the green edge. I don't know how well you can see it on the projector, but there's a green edge now. I can also resize this, so you can see it goes outside of our actual sprite. The green edge tells us where things collide. On our circles, we have a green ring around. That's the circle collider which tells us that they are, have a round collision. And we have the rigid body. A rigid body is the physics side of things. It, that's what adds gravity uh, and makes them able to push each other apart. And that's just adding those two scripts. We already have something working. We have two objects that slide around when they collide with each other. Um, next, I will show you something very important, especially in the early stages of development. In your assets list here, you can right click and you can click import package. You then have a, you can choose custom packages or you can have some preset things. These are very useful. They're scripts that are extremely handy in games. Uh, for example, I will import characters and we will wait for this to complete. Here we have a list of files that this package includes. I'll click Import. Uh, these default packages, as they're called, that we're importing now, uh, they are a collection of very useful stuff. Um, once you know how to program and know how to make games by yourself, you don't really need them that often. But they are very, very good for getting started. Uh, the one we're importing now is a character package. It includes stuff like third-person and first-person controllers. It includes uh, 3D models, sound files, uh, and all you need to get started with those types of games. So just wait for it to import. Uh, as I stated earlier, there are PCs with Unity installed and ready. Uh, if any of you want to work along uh, while I'm talking, feel free to do so. We now have a, uh, the standard, standard assets folder here, which includes a couple of uh, folders. We have characters. 
Let's see what's in the rollerball folder. Uh, prefabs. I need to talk about prefabs are pre-made objects. So this circle here that we made, we can turn this into a prefab if we want by simply dragging the object from our hierarchy, the scene, into our project folder. That will turn it into a prefab, which means it has all the settings that we set uh, already defined here. And we can drag it into our scene to make another one. Prefabs are very useful. It's basically cloning of an object. We see here that we have a roller ball, which is a prefab. I can pull it into the scene and look at it. See that it has a uh, fancy 3D model, and it has some colliders and rigid bodies and stuff. Now, this one was made for 3D, so it probably won't work well in our scene. I'll just delete it. We have first-person controllers. We have third-person controllers. So let's try one of those. Let's make a new scene. Don't save. And let's go for our third-person one. <coughs> we have the third-person controller. There's a guy here with glasses. Let's make a quick floor for him. 3 object. I'll make a cube. Now, I believe the third person character might have a camera. No, he doesn't. I will move my camera so we get a better view of him. I will add a light from the game object, just like we did with the empty objects earlier. I will add a light to our scene. Now we see that the, the cube looks a bit weird in our game view. So I will change to perspective. And it looks a bit more like a normal game. Now. All I did now was just I changed the camera, I added a light, I set the I made a ground, a floor. I will and I dragged the third person character from our standard assets into the scene. I will click play and see how that works. So we have a character, I can move around with him. I can jump, I can walk by holding shift, crouch by holding C. So we all already have a character moving around now. Uh, let's see if I have any. Uh, I don't think there's any cameras here. We can see if there are any standard packages with cameras. There is a cameras package. Let's import that. Check the cameras folder. We have some prefabs here. Let's delete our main camera from the scene. You see that we, the game shows nothing now because we have no cameras. Uh, and I will add the multi-purpose camera rig to our scene. You also see that there are some settings here. The most important is target. I will set the target to be our third person controller. Click play now. So now the camera follows us around. A bit slow in turning, but it does follow us. So we now have a basic game uh, by just dragging a few things in. We could now go and start adding shooting or add some uh, uh, pickups, whatever. Uh, or you could try some of the other controllers or packages that you can import. Uh, I will, however, show you basic, very quickly how to make your own components. So let's make a new scene again. I won't save. And I will create a, another sprite. We have some new sprites now, apparently, from one of our things. So let's use the arrows. 2D. 
what I want to do is in the uh, assets folder, I want to right click, click create, and C sharp script or C hashtag. Uh, we will call it simple move. Now, in the bottom corner here, I don't know how well you see it, but there is a small cogwheel spinning. That means that Unity is compiling our scripts, making them ready to, to play. Uh, we always need to wait for that after we change something in the code. I will double click on simple move, and it will load Mona Develop. Mona Develop is a free coding program, not the best. If you know any coders, they will probably call you a blasphemist. Uh, but it works, it's free, and it comes with Unity. Uh, let's see if I can zoom in. Default, by default, the colors are not black and white. Uh, I work at a school, so I am used to having projectors where you can't read code. So I change it to black and white. Um, this is what the code looks like by default when you first launch a brand new code. The first two lines here are tells us what libraries our code base is using. Uh, in other words, collection of existing code that we can access. The top one is Unity Engine. Ob for obviously obvious reasons, this is quite important. We want to have access to the Unity features. And System Collections, which is a package uh, for uh, having various collections of things, uh, things like lists and arrays. We probably won't be using any of them right now, but by default, that is very useful to import. Uh, so that is there. Now, most things in code exist of these curly brackets here um, and what's within them. So the first one here is a class. It's public, meaning other things can access it. It's called simple move. That was the name of our file. And the colon here means it extends. It's a uh, extension of Mona behavior, which is a different class, a different script. And ours expands upon that. It adds more to the Mona behavior, which is the standard in Unity. Every script on your, or on your objects are Mona behaviors. And as I said, the curly brackets means that everything within these two brackets is part of the simple move class. We also have two methods here. Methods are important in coding. It's a small collection of code that you can run by calling the method. Um, we have two methods here, start and update. They are default by Unity. Now, Unity will call every update in the Mona behavior every frame. It will call the start method in every Mona behavior on the first frame when you play the game. So everything we put in here will happen once at the start of the game, and everything we put in here will happen every frame. Now, for variables, uh, in other words, numbers or values that we might want to change, they are called variables. Let's make a public float move speed and set it to be 1. Again, public means we can access this from other places. A float is a number with quite a lot of decimals. I won't go into the details. I ha have no idea how much programming you guys know, but it's basically a number with lots of decimals, which we need because we can add s parts. We don't necessarily want the speed to be 1, but maybe 1.2. So we want decimals. So we will use a float. Now. In the update method, we want to move this object by using the keyboard. So I will, uh, I will uh, write a if uh, as I said, the curly brackets. If uh, is a tool that we use where we have normal brackets which is what we check in the if. And if that is true, it will run what's in the curly brackets. So what we want to check is if input, which is the uh, mouse, keyboard, gamepads, everything that the player gives to the game, 
if input dot get key down, that will check if a key has been clicked on your computer. We have three methods here. The top one is get key. That will tell us every frame that the key is clicked. So that's useful, for example, if you want to hold in rapid fire or if you want to have a jetpack when you're pressing. Uh, get key down will tell us true only when we click, so the first frame, uh, which is more useful for if you don't have rapid fire or if you want to use a health potion. You don't want to use a health potion the entire time you're holding H. You want, to have, you want it to happen once. So get down, uh, down is better for that. Get up is when you, the last frame when you release the button. So either of those two works well for activating items once. Uh, usually we just use down. I will use down brackets again, because this needs a value. It's asking for a key code. So let's just type key code uh, dot. And here is every single key on your keyboard. Let us try space. So now we have an if uh, sentence, checking if we click space. What we want to do then is move the object. Now, as I said in Unity, every object in your scene has a transform. And we want to change that val uh, values in it. So we will go to transform, not transform, transform dot, we have a position, and we have local position. Uh, position is where the object is in your scene. Uh, local position is where your object is compared to its parent, which I will show by going uh, and creating another sprite. Let's add the arrow there. You see that I have two objects now. And on the side here, I have two sprites. I will grab the first sprite and drag it on top of the second one. And you see it is now inside, or like, a like a file in a folder, um, which means it's a child. So if I move our arrow uh, plus now, it will move around. If I move the parent, as it's called, I will move both. Because the other one, this, the bottom one, is inside the first one. Now, in the code, the position, as I said, is his position in the world, while local is the position compared to its parent. Both can be useful depending on your situation. Right now I will just go to position and we will add a new vector3. Vector3 is a, uh, an object that contains three uh, floats. We have floats at the top here, we have the move speed. And it contains three floats, which is x, y, and z. So we will change the x value, which is the first number. It's always x, y, z. So we will change the x by our move speed. And we will change the others by 0. I will save this, and I will go back to Unity. As I said, wait for the compiler to finish. Uh, get rid of that other sprite, we don't need it. Now that our code is made, I'll add it to our object by just dragging it on. And we have the move speed here. Notice that. The move speed, since it's public, we have access to it in our inspector, and we can change it by dragging or typing. Very useful. Now I'll press play, and we'll see if we can move our object by pressing space. Also, it doesn't happen when I hold it in, because it only checks when I click down. So we can move it by tapping. If we change this value, let's try minus 2, so it will go back the other uh, way. It also goes faster. Minus 5, or actually plus 5. Now it goes a lot further. So our speed works. What I want to do now is I will chain, get rid of the down, because I want to hold this down, I want to hold the key in. Now, any of you who has played old games will know that if you try to run an old game on your computer now, you'll die instantly. 
your character will, when you click sideways, your character will zoom off the screen. Enemies will fly at you faster than bullets, and you have no idea what's going on. The game is too fast. That is because a long time ago, games did this. They moved your character by a set amount, and it did not care about your frame rate. Your computers are much stronger now. While your computer back 20 years ago had 10 frames per second, now you can get up to 100, which means that this update method will go 100 times per second instead of 10. So we want to do something about that. Uh, there is, thankfully, an easy way to do it. We will multiply our value by time delta time. Time delta time is the amount of seconds it took since the last frame. Meaning the faster frame rate you have, the lower this number. And then by multiplying move speed with it, we will move slower if you have a high frame rate. Usually time delta time is something like 0 0.6 or 0 0.2, possibly less depending on your PC. And so by adding times or multiply time delta time, your object will move compared to how fast your PC is instead of a set amount, meaning that our sphere will now move the same speed on two different PCs. I'll save and I'll press play, and we will immediately notice that I am slower. That is because it is being divided because I have a decent PC. If I had a sucky PC, it would stay at the same speed. So now if I hold space, it moves slower because it's being uh, divided by my frame rate. But luckily, I can change the move speed on the fly while we're playing. I can just drag it, and it happens instantly. Now, an important thing to remember is when you change uh, numbers and stuff in the inspector while in play mode, when I turn it off, it's back to 1. That is because you're in testing mode, uh, meaning that you can try out new things without being afraid to break or ruin your settings. Um, it can be annoying sometimes when you find the perfect setup or you've sat changing lots of small numbers and you're finally satisfied and you forget to turn off play. Then you curse loudly and move on with your life. Um, it's important to remember that. There are a few ways of helping you remember that. You can go to, uh, let's see if I remember how to do this. You can go to Preferences on Edit, Colors, and you can set the Play Mode Tint. Let's set that to a darker shade, or even better, let's set it to red. Red is dangerous. So now if I press Play, everything goes red. Which is useful, because now I definitely remember that changing this is not good. Uh, that was probably a bit too red. Set it to a bit more tint instead. That's better. Now we can see the slight difference, and I can possibly remember that I'm in edit mode. Um, however, going one direction, however, is not a, always a good thing. We want to go both ways. Now, what I can do is I can add the left arrow, and we can copy this and add the right arrow, and we can say minus move speed, and it will go the other way. So now, as soon as the play button turns blue, there you go, now I can move both ways. Increase the move speed, there you go, you can go both ways. There is a better method than this though. So. First, I will comment this out. Now, in coding, you have these slash stars, which are very useful for turning off code. Uh, really, it's for writing comments, like here. You see also double slash does the same thing. Uh, double slash is only one line. Slash star does everything until the next star slash. Uh, usually, comments are for writing comments, so the next person can understand your code. Very useful. Uh, but also, you can use it for turning off code while you're still trying things out. So I've now turned off those two. I will add a new one. I'll go transform, 
position plus input oops input get axis i will tell you how this works in a second horizontal let's try out and then i will tell you how it works later oh an error let's see what the console says cannot be done cannot be done because this returns a float while position is a vector 3 so what i will do is i'll add a vector 3 uh, forward so we want to go forwards multiplied by that now vector 3 forward is just a shortcut for as we said vector 3 is three numbers we have a f x y and z vector 3 is basically uh, sorry vector 3 dot forward is 1 0 0 uh, vector 3 dot right is 0 1 0 and vector 3 up is 0 0 1 basically shortcuts for the three directions and uh, I am multiplying that by our input. So now we should not have an error, and I can click play. Now, let's see, it's moving in the wrong direction. So I will change that to be left. Because forwards was apparently inwards in our scene, which doesn't really work because we don't have perspective. There you go. Oh, he's fast. I can go in both directions now, which is good. I also noticed I am uh, he's going the wrong way compared to what I'm clicking, so I'll change that to right, which is obviously the opposite of left. Um, and he was also too fast because time delta time. I also want to be able to control this in the inspector, so we'll add our move speed here as well because then I can change the speed of things. So now we have the direction, which is right. It is being multiplied by the input, horizontal, the time between the, uh, since the last frame, and the move speed. So we can control the speed. It is the same on every PC. It is based on what I'm clicking. And it is on left and right. So save and run. He's now a lot slower. Let's change this to 10. He's now at a decent speed. And it's the same on every computer, which is even better. You do not want to make a uh, eSport game without time delta time. That would be bad. Uh, the way input get access works, because this is very important. This is very cool. If I go to Edit, Project Settings, input I will have a list of axes here axes apparently they are uh, yes we have horizontal here that is what I wrote in here uh, you notice the Quotation marks, there you go. Um, quotation marks means that it is a string. This is not code. It is a, a uh, sentence or a word that I've written. If I just write hori horizontal, you see that my auto completion here is trying to tell me what I'm wanting to type, but it's not because it's failing. If I were to just type this, this code would say, oh, I don't know what horizontal is because it's not actually code. So I put the quotation marks to tell it that that is a name. That is the name of this axis. Now, if I open this, you will see that it has negative button and positive button, left and right. It also has alternative, negative and positive, A and D. And it has some settings, which means if I click play, previously, uh, on, our on our first example here, I could only use the left and right arrow, which is over here. Now I can use the A and D as well. Magic. Another thing is that there is two here called horizontal. The second one has got joystick axis, 
Were I to connect a uh, Xbox gamepad now, I could steer with a joystick. And A and D, and arrows. All with one line. Multi-platform. Uh, that is the basics of movement. If you want to do more, you would obviously need to learn a bit more coding. Um, or Google. Uh, check out the Unity forums. There's a lot of good resources out there for learning Unity and learning how to program. Um, before I finish, though, I will show some more useful things. First, if we want to make a build, builds are executables, the .exe file that you want to send to your friends and brag, or send to the Steam store and sell it. Go to Build Settings from File. Uh, we will need to save our scene first. Before I save it, actually, I want to set my sprite's move speed up because I forgot to do it when it wasn't in play mode. Um, I will save the scene as scene. You see it now pops up in my uh, project folder as well because you can have multiple scenes and just double click it to change between them. Um, I will then add current so it pops up in the list. And here's what you can export to. This is one of the strong powers with Unity. We can make this in our browser, play it in our browser. We can play it on PC, Mac, Linux. We can play it on iOS, Android, Blackberry. Windows Store games you can make. Or you can make it for Windows phones. WebGL, so you don't need a plugin in your browser. You just click play. 360, Xbox One, PS3, PS Vita, and PS4. Apparently, Wii U is not in the list, even though I know that is supported. We will, however, make for PC. So let's click Build. I like making a folder called Builds, just to keep it clean and out of the way. We will name it Gathering with typos. Now it is compiling my game. It's making an executable that I can send to friends, uh, or Steam, or publishers, investors, whoever wants to see it, or competitions like the fast game development <coughs> here at the gathering, you can win prizes. Let's see. Uh, it is compiling my game, turning it into an, an executable, uh, and now it's done. Now, whenever you send in a project to anyone, it is very important to include both of these folders. The data is all your code and resources and everything. Very important. If I were to send the executables to someone without the data folder, he would not have a fun game, because nothing would happen. So always include both these two things. Very important. If I run get, get ring because of my typo, it will show a pop-up where I can choose my resolution. I can choose the quality which monitor I'm on, or Windows. Uh, I am not sure if the projector will have a mad fit if I try changing the resolution, so I'll just go for the safe mode with Windows. We see a fancy logo at the start. Now, that logo at the start, you cannot change with the free version. However, if you pay for professional version, you can change it. But then again, at competi competitions like The Gathering or publishers or whatever, they don't really care. Uh, so use it. I can move my thing, my sphere. It works. So um, that's how you make a build. As I said, these two files, I can add them to a zip, add them to builds raw, and I can send this zip to friends, and they and it will work on their computer as well, hopefully. That is one of the most important things to know. The second is if you go to Window, an asset store. Let's see, I do have internet, so. The asset store is extremely useful. It is possibly the most used feature on my front because you can uh, get free code and models and everything. Let's see, if I wanted some graphics, let's go to 3D models here on the side. Characters. We always want characters. Sort by price. Unity Chan, yes. Sounds amazing. Unity Chan is apparently a free character that you can use in your game. There's 
as I said, there's quite a few. We have a soldier pack for free, a robot for free, a red samurai for free, a zombie for free. There's a lot of free packages here, and this is just characters. There's lots of things here. We can have environments, props, uh, we've got sound, audio, music, even script. We can go to scripting, sort by price, and we can see what kind of code we can download. Uh, touch script. Just install that, follow its readme, and you can get it working on touch devices. Facebook integration. That is why the asset store is so useful. You have a lot of code and resources here that you can use. Uh, most of it is free. Well, well a lot of it is free. Uh, a lot of it also costs money. Let's go to page 10, where things are starting to get pricey. No, actually, we're still on the free stuff. There, one dollar. Um, there is a lot of useful stuff here. And if you're a serious developer, you'll understand that uh, it's often worth buying stuff from the asset store. Uh, at first, when I started developing, I found some codes here, and it was like $10. Uh, and I looked at it, and it was like, I can make that myself. Why should I pay for it? And then uh, my employer, my boss, he um, told me an interesting thing that I'd actually never thought of. And that's the fact that, yes, I can make it myself, but it will take me a couple of hours. Considering my hourly rate, my wage, that means that I've lost money. While if I paid $10 for it, I've gained money. Well, not technically, but you know what I mean. So always consider how long it will take you. If, even if you can make it yourself, always consider how long it will take you and is it worth it. In that time that I could have spent making that script, I was instead getting paid to do something useful. So $10 is not much. $50. If this light 2D here is $50, if this is worth it, it is often better to buy it than to start making it yourself. There is a, as I said, there's a lot of stuff here. You can also search, uh, add stuff to the wish list. And there's a lot of free stuff. So the asset store is worth it. Um, that was it for my quick introduction to Unity. Uh, as I said, there are some machines if you want to try it out. I will hang around for some minutes now if anyone has questions. Um, yes, that was Unity. <laughs>